Good afternoon. So we're uh, working our way through the rest of the thermal topics here. We are now done with internal combustion engines. And today we're going to start looking at natural gas power plants. Now, as we'll learn, these natural gas power plants run on a thermodynamic cycle that we call the Brayton cycle. And we'll introduce the ideas behind the Brayton cycle today and do an example problem. So today we're going to talk about the Brayton cycle. So this is a natural gas power plant cycle. You can see here we have a sort of a compressor and a turbine that run on the same shaft. We pull in air from the surrounding environment. We compress it in the compressor. Then it runs to a combustor. So in this combustor we have this natural gas that's burning that heats up the fluid, causes it to expand out the turbine, and then we exhaust that exhaust gas into the environment again. What's a little bit interesting about this Brayton cycle, I think, is that the turbine is on the same shaft as the compressor. So unlike, say, a Rankine cycle, where the turbine is generating power, puts it on the grid, and then we plug the pump in that Rankine cycle back in so that it's still using the, the power from the turbine, but kind of electrically, here, these the compressor and the turbine are mechanically coupled so we're directly transmitting the power from the turbine to the compressor and then the net power goes into some sort of an electrical generator which is shown here and that power goes out onto the grid so brayton cycles are pretty important right so why do you care in uh you know if you look at the textbook i think that the, this number used to be something like 20 percent in the uh the textbook but you know, because of kind of fracking and the uh, explosion of natural gas power plants, maybe that's not the right word choice here, right? But the dramatic increase in the number of natural gas power plants here in the United States, um, we now generate about 40% of our electricity using these natural gas power plants. And natural gas power plants run on Brayton cycles, right? Again, so this is uh, this uh, data here comes from uh, the government here and it's for 2019. So just about 40% of our power comes from these natural gas power plants, right? And this is one of the big reasons why, um, you know, the U.S. is becoming sort of self-sufficient in terms of energy production. So here, this table is from our textbook. It lists different types of power plants and the thermodynamic cycles that they run on. So here we can see that these natural gas powered power plants run on Brayton cycles. So this is why Brayton cycles are important to us and why I think it's useful for us as mechanical engineers to study how these things work. And again, about 40% of uh, power currently generated in the United States comes from these Brayton cycles. So why do we like to use gas turbines, right? Or why do we like these natural gas power plants? So they're faster and cheaper to build these power plants, particularly when you're comparing them to nuclear power uh, generation stations. Uh, they also have a smaller footprint. The United States has large shale gas deposits. So basically we have a lot of natural gas here that we can extract and that sort of leads to energy independence for the United States. Um, they're used in power plants, right, which we'll talk about. That's what these sort of uh, Brayton cycles are used for. But we'll also learn how the Brayton cycle ultimately is kind of the core of a jet propulsion engine right, or a turbojet engine, which is kind of our next area of study after we learn about Brayton cycles. Now, what we know as engineers is that all decisions kind of have trade-offs. So certainly there are advantages to using gas turbines, um, but there are disadvantages as well. It's not up here too, but um, certainly one of the pros for these natural gas power plants is that there are less carbon emissions uh, per net power when you compare them to something like coal. So uh, obviously more emissions than nuclear, but sort of less catastrophic risk as well. So there's, you know, with all of these decisions that we make, there's a trade-off between sort of the cost and the benefit, right? Some of the cons that are associated with these gas power plants is that they are still burning fossil fuels. So there's still emissions that are associated with these plants. Although, as I said, uh, fewer emissions than a coal-fired power plant. There's also... Um, 
environmental and political issues with extracting natural gas from the uh, from the earth, right? So this is fracking, and depending on where you live, maybe you've uh, seen some of the discussions about uh, potential downsides of fracking. We uh, we also have these. So this is so basically, what do these Brayton power plants look like, right? Or how do we model them? So they're open systems. Right, just like in the first picture that we saw, right, where with this compressor we're pulling air in from the environment, right, and then we go through. So this is increasing the pressure. Then we increase the temperature by adding heat through this combustor where we're burning the fuel, and then that uh, gas expands through our turbine, which is what's creating power. Some of that power is transmitted through this shaft to the compressor, and the rest goes out to the generator where we put that energy out onto the grid. Now, even though kind of a real Brayton system looks like this, right, where we're in, where we have air intake and air exhaust, we'll model this, at least at times, as if it's a closed system. So here, we're going to sort of look at this, or we can treat this similarly to a system where there's this extra heat exchanger here where we're rejecting heat. So basically, if we think about a Brayton cycle as a closed system like this, then this extra heat exchanger where we're rejecting heat is essentially the environment. That that's basically we're putting hot air into the environment out of the turbine. You could think of that air sort of moving through the environment, eventually cooling back down to whatever the ambient temperature is, and then coming back into the compressor. So when you look at this, Right? There's ways that this is similar to a Rankin cycle. Right? So we have a turbine. We have a place where we're adding heat by burning things. Right? So it used to be a steam generator if we were talking about a Rankin cycle, but now it's a combustion chamber because right? there's no steam in here. The working fluid is air that we're just pulling out of the environment. We have a compressor instead of a pump, but the purpose here is still to increase the pressure of our working fluid. So because this process, even if we think about it in total as a closed process like this, each of these processes happen in a different component. And each of those components will model as an open system. So again, we're going to have to start worrying about things like conservation of mass, and we're going to use the open versions of conservation of energy and the open version of the second law if we ever have to do a second law analysis. So how does this uh, gas turbine power plant or Brayton cycle work? So air enters the compressor, right? So this air is just pulled in from the environment. It's at whatever atmospheric pressure is and whatever the ambient temperature is. But as it goes through the compressor, we add work or power in, right? So we're, And when we do that, we increase the enthalpy of the working fluid, which is the air. So what we're doing is we're increasing the pressure of that air through the compressor. Now, air moves from the compressor into the combustion chamber or the combustor. Right there, it's mixed with fuel. So you'd have sort of an uh, atomized or basically you take the fuel and you make it into small little droplets. Right, You atomize it and then it burns. And because it's burning, right, we're adding heat into the system. And that increases the temperature. So you kind of get this air-fuel mixture. We burn the fuel. We increase the enthalpy again now by adding heat. And then this sort of high temperature, high pressure gas wants to expand through our turbine. And as it expands through our turbine, it generates power, right? So it moves over the fan blades in the turbine. And because those fan blades are connected to this shaft, that causes this shaft to spin. Now, because the shaft is spinning, this is what drives the compressor and the sort of net power. Right? Because the turbine is producing more power than the compressor requires, the rest of the power goes into some kind of an electrical generator so we can put power out onto the grid. There's always more air coming in to the compressor, and there's no real heat exchanger here where we're sort of rejecting heat to the environment. Instead, we just exhaust this hot air coming out of the turbine out to the environment and then we pull clean air that's at a lower temperature into the compressor. So this is a little bit neat here because the, you know, again, like the, the turbine 
the shaft on the turbine and the shaft on the compressor are mechanically connected. So the turbine is mechanically driving the compressor, unlike we said in the Rankine cycle, where, uh, you know, there's still, it's still the power generated from the turbine that's running the pump, but it kind of goes out onto the grid first, right? And you have to plug the pump in, right? And like we said, the remainder of that power goes out to the electrical generator. So where do we get heat in, right? So here we're combusting a fossil fuel, right? Natural gas in this case. So this can be, you know, you can get the fuel, typically it's natural gas, but you can get the fuel uh, from biomass or municipal solid waste. Um, you could actually, you can actually set these up so that you're taking waste heat in from another process. So let's say you had a Rankine cycle and that Rankine cycle has to reject heat, right? So what if that rejected heat became the input heat for this Brayton cycle? Right? And then you cascade these systems together so that you're ultimately rejecting less heat to the environment, which is driving up your thermal efficiency. So you can take waste heat from another process and have that be the input heat here so that you can use some of that heat. You can set this up in sort of a green energy type of way by using things like solar energy as well. You could also have a gas-cooled nuclear reactor, which is, again, kind of using waste heat from another process. So you can set these up, and even though we're sort of studying these different um, heat engines separately, each one of these heat engines has some waste heat. So you can use that waste heat to fuel something else. And if you can chain those things together, you do increase your ultimate thermal efficiency. So, again, these systems aren't actually closed like this. But it can help from an analysis standpoint to pretend that there's an extra heat exchanger here. You can't really do this because if you did and your air was just in a closed system, as you went through your combustion chamber, you're depleting the working fluid of oxygen as you're burning your fuel, right? So then you would keep, you'd get incomplete combustion, right? So that's why you want to sort of reject your exhaust gases and pull in new gas from the environment so that your O2 content stays high. But we can think about this system as gas circulating through these four components. And then we can do sort of an open system analysis on each one of these components. So we have the compressor. The purpose of the compressor is to add power into the working fluid. Then we have this heat exchanger, our combustor, where we're adding heat into the working fluid. Then our turbine. So here we're extracting power from the working fluid, right? So here we're going to decrease the enthalpy of the fluid so that we can get mechanical work or mechanical power out from the turbine. And then we reject heat. Now, like I said, in the real system, this heat rejection comes in the form of just exhausting this high temperature fluid out into the environment. Right? I kind of like these animations where the ball goes around the circle. Right? So it's a cycle. Right? And even though, right, so that's kind of why we put this extra heat exchanger here, at least kind of in our minds, is because then we can see how we get from this output state of the turbine back to the input state of the compressor. And then we think about this as a cycle. So here, you know, if you modeled this as a four component system like this, then we'd have this heat transfer out, but there's really no heat exchanger here. And that comes just from exhausting fluid into the environment. So... I've been talking about all these cycle problems as being very similar, right? And the way that we can sort of navigate our way through this, right? Like a choose your own adventure book is we answer three questions. So the first question is, what's the uh, purpose of the cycle? So is it a heat engine or is it for temperature management? The second question is, are we going to do open system analyses or closed system analyses? That'll get us to some symbolic solutions, right? Because it'll tell us which version of the first law to use, for example. And then we'll have an equation with either U's or H's in it, and we'll have to um, fix all the states. So we need to know what's the working fluid. So if we compare the Brayton cycle on the right here back to the Rankine cycle, we can ask these three questions. And the first question looks the same for both of these systems. They're both heat engines. So the energy benefit is net power, and the energy cost is heat transferred into the system, right, from burning fossil fuels in this case. In both cases, we're going to look at each individual component as an open system process. So basically, each of these processes happens in a different physical location, 
unlike our internal combustion engine, where all the processes basically still happened inside the piston cylinder assembly, even though the piston would be moving up and down. But the difference between the Rankine cycle and the Brayton cycle comes when we ask our third question, what's the working fluid? So in the Brayton cycle, it's an ideal gas, right? So that's more like how we were dealing with these internal combustion engines, right? Whereas in the Rankine cycle, it was water. So even though the answers to our first two questions are the same, the answer to our third question is different. So basically the difference between Rankine cycles and Brayton cycles from kind of an analysis point of view is that we'll be fixing our states differently. But otherwise we'll use a lot of the same strategies we used for Rankine cycles to solve these Brayton cycles. So we need to know we fix the states using the same methods that we did for internal combustion engines or at least similar methods because we'll use different expressions for the isentropic processes. Now remember also, when I was talking about these processes, right? so cycles where the working fluid is an ideal gas, the trick is to look for isentropic processes. Now isentropic processes happen when something is adiabatic. So if we had an ideal compressor or an ideal turbine, that process would be isentropic. If we did a second law analysis, we'd see that delta S would be zero. So here, if we knew the isentropic compressor and the compressor efficiency, then we could get the real outlet to the, to the compressor. And if we knew how the isentropic turbine operated and we knew the turbine efficiency, then we could find the outlet of the real turbine. So the working fluid is the same as it was for the internal combustion engines, right? And remember when we talked about internal combustion engines, we said like, oh, these things are actually pretty complicated. And the only way we're gonna get answers using pen and paper will be to do a whole bunch of different assumptions, right? And it turns out when we talk about Brayton cycles, we'll run a lot of those same assumptions as we turn to this kind of air standard analysis for Brayton cycles. So we're still gonna neglect combustion we're still going to treat the heat addition process as if it's just air passing through the combustor and we're adding heat. Even though in real life, what's happening is we're mixing fuel with that air and then we're combusting that fuel and there's chemical reactions that are taking place. Unlike the internal combustion engines, we are not going to model processes as closed system processes. We're going to model all of these processes as open system processes because our working fluid is moving through each component as we work our way through the cycle. For internal combustion engines, we assumed that all processes were reversible. We're not going to do that here, but it's still important for us to look for isentropic processes because then we can see what an ideal turbine or an ideal compressor looks like, and then maybe we can find the efficiencies of the turbine and the compressor, or we can use them to find the real outlets. We're still gonna assume that the working fluid is an ideal gas. So that's similar to what we did for internal combustion engines. Although when we identify the isentropic processes, we'll use different relationships because in the Brayton cycle, we're typically going to know pressure, pressure ratios. You'll find I have trouble saying that, especially when we're talking about compressor pressure ratios. Whereas in internal combustion engines, we knew the ratio of volumes, right? So we knew the compression ratio, which was a ratio of volumes, or a cutoff ratio, which was a ratio of volumes. So here we'll be looking for expressions that relate um, changes in enthalpy or changes in temperature to changes in pressure and not changes in volume. But just like in internal combustion engines, sometimes we will model these processes using constant specific heat analyses and sometimes we'll use variable specific heat. So if we're talking about constant specific heat, we'll have delta H terms that turn into Cp times delta T. And when we look for isentropic processes, we'll look for an expression that has K in the exponent, but we'll look for one that has a pressure ratio instead of a volume ratio. So this is the Brayton cycle. Like we said, it's got these four components and it's got this kind of like faux dotted out heat exchanger here, right? Because really we're exhausting air to the environment and we're pulling air in over here. But we can analyze this as if there's a heat exchanger between state four 
in state one. The answer to our first question was that the Brayton cycle is a heat engine, which means that the energy benefit is net power and the energy cost is heat in. We also, just like with um, Rankin cycles, we have to be aware that the power plant is the first customer of the power plant. So some of the turbine power has to go back into powering the compressor. And one of the differences between Brayton cycles and Rankin cycles is that the Rankin cycle, backwork ratios were very low, like 1% to 2%. But for Brayton cycles, backwork ratios can be pretty high. Remember, we talked about when we talked about Brayton cycles, you know, the or the Rankin cycles, one of the downsides is we lose a lot of heat as we're condensing the fluid, as we're moving from steam back to liquid. We lose a lot of heat and that can affect our thermal efficiency. But, you know, the trade off for doing that was we had a liquid at the end and it's relatively, it doesn't take a lot of work to increase the pressure of a liquid. It's a little bit different for these Brayton cycles because increasing the pressure of a gas does take a, a significant amount of power. So here we have reasonably high backwork ratios compared to Rankin cycles, but we can get even better thermal efficiencies because we don't have that large heat loss that's associated with condensing fluid like we do in a Rankin cycle. So it's always, it's a bit of a, you know, you got to, you know, sort of pick your poison, right? That, uh, no process is perfect. Uh, these Brayton cycles tend to have high backwork ratios, but they can still have high thermal efficiencies because they don't have to condense that working fluid. So because we're going to treat each process as an open system process, we have to revisit the first law for open systems. Assumptions that we're going to make at least sometimes for these open systems include steady state. We almost always make this assumption. So if you're lost on an exam, and you have an open system process, and you have to write down assumptions, writing down that it's at steady state is a pretty good bet. In this case, for all the components, they're one inlet and one outlet. This is different than the Rankin cycle, where in the Rankin cycle, this was almost always true. But remember, we had that Rankin cycle with regeneration, and then sometimes we, had, um, we split the mass, right? So I guess you can still have some processes when we do regeneration in the Brayton cycles we'll have uh, regenerators that have more than one inlet and more than one outlet but we're never going to split the mass in one of these Brayton cycles we're always going to neglect kinetic energy changes and potential energy changes we'll look at each component and if we don't have other information we'll decide whether or not it's supposed to be adiabatic meaning no heat loss or passive meaning no power generation or no power required. Just like in the Rankin cycle, we'll typically neglect friction losses between components and heat losses between components so that we don't have to fix um, lots of different states or even more states than we otherwise would as we move through the cycle. When we do this, if we can make the assumptions that we're used to making, we'll end up essentially with the same equations that we got when we had the Rankin cycle. If we're talking about power, we'll have m dot times h in minus h out. We'll let the first law tell us what the sign is and we'll get net power by adding these numbers together. Here the compressor is like the pump, so its power is negative and the turbine is still a turbine and its power is positive. When we talk about heat, heat rate, we'll have m dot times h out minus h in and we'll expect that as we're adding heat in the combustor, that that heat is positive. And as we're rejecting heat from kind of our faux heat exchanger here, then uh, we'll have negative heat transfer rate, right? So that's kind of the heat rejection. So now we're going to get similar equations that we would get if this was a Rankine cycle. But again, every one of these processes or every one of these cycles has a bit of a different wrinkle. And the difference in the wrinkle between the Rankine cycle and the Brayton cycle is how do we fix the states, right? What's the fluid? How do we find these H's or these delta H's, right? And the answer is it's an ideal gas. So we've got to use things like the ideal gas law in these isentropic relationships. So the Brayton cycle, it's important to be able to draw a TS diagram, right? So a TS diagram over here, 
right? So it looks like this is basically what a Rankine cycle process would look like if we were super far away from the vapor dome. So if you think about air, the vapor dome is probably down here somewhere, right? And now we're very far away between two pressures, right? So here, as we move between, between state one and state two, this is our compressor, we're increasing the pressure. If it's an ideal compressor or an isentropic pressure, this is a vertical line, right? Remember, when we have a cycle where the working fluid is an ideal gas, it's very important to be able to identify these isentropic processes. Then we'll assume that heat addition happens at constant pressure. So we have a constant pressure line from two to three. You can see that here on our PV diagram. This is constant pressure heat addition. And then as we go through the turbine, we have another potentially isentropic process if it's an ideal turbine. And then we have constant pressure heat rejection. We assume this happens at constant pressure because what happens is we have fluid that's exiting in a jet out into the atmosphere so we assume that's at atmospheric pressure and then we're pulling air in from the atmosphere so it also comes into the system at atmospheric pressure so this process which doesn't actually occur in a component so if you were drawing this and you didn't want to have this line if you wanted to have a dotted line or a dashed line here that would be fine too but it's moving at constant pressure from state four to state one in our first process, we're adding power. In our second process, we're adding heat through the combustor. In our third process, we go through the turbine and we're generating power. And in our fourth process, we're rejecting heat to the environment. So this is what a PV or a TS diagram looks like for a Brayton cycle. So when we think about the final exam, on a long answer problem, you might be asked to draw either a PV or a TS diagram, or maybe both. I tend to think for open system processes, these TS diagrams are more useful. And for closed system processes, these PV diagrams are more useful, right? Because we might have to find, say, the integral of PDV. So charting it out like this is useful. But if it's a multiple choice question, maybe I'll give you uh, multiple choice answers that have pictures of different uh, TS diagrams. And I'll ask you, which is the TS diagram for a Brayton cycle, and you'll have to pick uh, maybe this one versus a Rankine cycle one, right? So remember Rankine cycles, those are the ones that are gonna have vapor domes on them. Brayton cycle, because the process is an ideal, or the working fluid is an ideal gas, there's no vapor dome here. So assumptions that we make that kind of show up on these graphs is that as we're adding or rejecting heat, we assume there's no friction losses. So this happens at constant pressure. And as we're doing work or adding work to the system or getting work out, we may assume that these are isentropic. And then we would have, so if we had an ideal turbine or an ideal compressor, these would be vertical lines. And if they weren't isentropic, then just like in a Rankine cycle, you'd have your real process that goes from one to two, but slopes up and to the right. And in the real turbine, you would go down from three to four, that's down and to the right. So remember, if it's, a real process, the entropy is increasing if it's adiabatic, which means that we would always be moving to the right instead of vertically. If we have an ideal Brayton cycle, then on a PV diagram, the area inside our cycle diagram is the net work, and the area inside our TS diagram is the net heat. Right Now, this is kind of interesting because we can, again, just like we did with internal combustion engines, you can change different parameters. And if you see the area inside your cycle changing, you might be able to tell me whether or not the net work is changing or maybe whether or not the uh, efficiency of the cycle is changing as well. So if it's ideal, then you, you can look at these two areas and sort of know that those areas are equal. So if it's an ideal cycle in all the different processes, then the net work is equal to the net heat. So here we can see, just like we saw with the internal combustion engine, we can change different parameters and get different results. So just like, remember when we talked about the internal combustion engines, we could change the uh, compression ratio. With the Braden cycles, we can also change the compressor pressure ratio, right? Which is not easy for me to say. The compressor pressure ratio is going to be 
the pressure at the exit of our compressor divided by the pressure at the inlet of our compressor, right? So if we go here between state one, state two, state three, and state four, here we have a lower compression ratio, compressor, compre <laughs> compressor pressure ratio than if we go from one to two prime to three prime down to four prime, right? Because here we're in, we're adding more pressure, right? Because these constant pressure lines, they move up, right? As we increase the pressure. Now, we're going to be limited. Remember, we talked about the, right? Because you might be asking, why can't three prime be vertically above three? And that's because ultimately the turbine is limited by its melting point, right? So the inlet temperature to the turbine is going to be either the melting point of the turbine or close enough to the melting point that we feel safe or it's going to be limited by the combustion temperature of our fuel. So the maximum temperature in both of these practical cases will be the same. So if we increase the compressor pressure ratio, we get one result. And if we uh, leave the compressor pressure ratio lower, then we get a different result. So here, cycle A has a greater compressor pressure ratio. So that's moving between state 1, state 2 prime, state 3 prime, and state 4 prime. This cycle has more efficiency. It's uh, increased thermal efficiency here. So just like when we increase the compressor ratio or the compression ratio in an internal combustion engine, we got more efficiency. We also get more efficiency in the Brayton cycle when we increase the compressor pressure ratio. But if you look at these two cycles, you can see that with the lower compressor pressure ratio, we get more net work. Right. So if you were choosing between these two cycles, right, a lot of times our job as engineers is to say, well, what's the point of my application? Am I trying to maximize efficiency or am I trying to maximize power? Right. And that can the answer can be different depending on what application you're working on. Right. But here your selection of the pressure ratio um, sort of depends on what you're looking for, where a higher compressor pressure ratio will give you higher thermal efficiency, but less net work. So you have to think about your application, right? So if you're talking about an aero application, right? Because remember I said that these um, Brayton cycles, they sort of form the core of a turbojet engine. So here you, you're probably trying to maximize your power to weight ratio because you want to be able to fly your airplane, right? So here you might want to be, you might be more interested in net power than you are in efficiency. And that's not to say that you're not interested in efficiency because if you can improve efficiency, of a turbojet engine, right? And you think in normal times, how much air traffic we have, um, even small changes in efficiency uh, can result in very large reductions in cost and in sort of total emissions, right? So it's still important, but as engineers, right? A lot of times when we turn knobs, you know, something gets better and something gets worse. So we have to sort of think about what our main objective is. In power generation applications, maybe we're more concerned with efficiency than net power. Of course, we're still worried about net power because we're trying. that's what we're trying to put out on the grid. But here, maybe we're less constrained by the size or weight of the system and we can be more concerned with efficiency because these uh, power generation stations are essentially going to be operating continuously for very long periods of time. So we have to think about our application and then kind of which... Um, which parameter is more important for our application. A lot of times that's kind of the job of the engineer, right? So you have to be able to think about trade-offs and make decisions that, uh, that are good for whatever business you're trying to conduct. Now we've been talking about ideal compressors and ideal turbines, but we all know that those things don't exist, right? So as we look at real turbines and real compressors, we have to think about isentropic efficiency. So isentropic efficiency, right? Remember, we talked about this. If we know the isentropic efficiency and we know the how the ideal turbine or compressor would operate, then we're going to be able to figure out the outlet state for the real system. And even though these real or these ideal processes don't exist, they still tell us kind of the limit of what's possible, right? So it's still important to know sort of the best case scenario. We can define isentropic efficiencies for turbines and for compressors. Compressors look just like pumps. So here the ideal compressor consumes less power than the real compressor. 
But in terms of the turbine, the ideal turbine produces more power than the real turbine. Right? So these efficiencies look just like they did in the Rankine cycles, provided we remember that the compressor is like a pump. It's increasing the pressure of something, but it's increasing the compressor of a gas instead of a liquid. Here, if we can make the assumptions that we normally would across a turbine and a pump, we know that these power terms are H in minus H out for both the real and the ideal case. So we would get these expressions for isentropic efficiencies. So now that we've kind of introduced a little bit what the Brayton cycle is about, we can go through and do an example of kind of this basic four component Brayton cycle, even though I guess here the fourth component is kind of uh, left to our imagination, right? So in this problem, we're told the inlet temperature of the compressor, the inlet pressure, so this is kind of like the atmospheric pressure, we're given essentially the compressor pressure ratio because we're told the pressure after, com after the compressor, and we're also told the maximum temperature in the cycle. Right, so here on my TS diagram, I can see pretty clearly that state three is the maximum temperature in my cycle. So maybe on a problem, it would give me this information in the table already if the problem was being nice to me, but it might also just say in words that the maximum temperature is 1700 Kelvin, and then I'd have to know that this temperature is T3. So that's another reason why it's nice to be able to draw these TS diagrams. We're asked to find the net power in the system per unit mass or per kilogram of air that's flowing through the system. That's big W dot net divided by M dot or little w dot net. And then we're also asked to find the thermal efficiency of the system provided the turbine and the compressor are isentropic. So how do we go about doing this, right? And the real reason here that, that I like to do these examples is because probably you can do the symbolic solutions already, although it's good to review that because we're coming back to these uh, open processes. But it's also important to look to see how we're going to fix the states, how we're going to march through this particular state table to get to answers. So our symbolic solution for net power divided by mass flowing through the system, little w dot net, is the power per mass flowing through the system of the turbine plus the power per mass flowing through the compressor, right? So little w dot t plus little w dot c, recognizing that the compressor power is going to be negative. For the turbine and the compressor, we'll say that the systems are steady state, one inlet, one outlet, no kinetic or potential energy change, and that they're both adiabatic. If that's true, these would both be from the first law, m dot times h in minus h out, but here we're dividing the whole equation by m dot, so these little w dots are just going to be h in minus h out. So if that's the case, the inlet to my turbine is state 3, so this is h3. The outlet is h4, so this is h3 minus h4, and the compressor is h1 minus h2, and again, h2 is going to be bigger than h1. If I was doing a cold air standard analysis, right, or if I was assuming constant specific heat, then these delta H's would both be CP times delta T. When I do this, I assume that it's the same specific heat through the whole problem. So I pull that CP out from both of these delta H's, and I get CP times, all in brackets, T3 minus T4 plus T1 minus T2. So that gives me... Uh, the net power per unit mass flowing through the system. I don't know T4. I do know CP. I don't know T2. I do know T3, and I know T1. So here, I don't have a numerical solution yet because I haven't found T2 or T4, but at least I got a symbolic solution, right? So if I was on an exam, I would have demonstrated to the grader that I know how to get these equations starting from the first law. The symbolic solution for the second part here is going to be this net power, which I've already found, divided by the in the heat rate into the system, right, which happens in the combustor. So here for the combustor, I'm going to say that it's steady state, one inlet, one outlet. I'm going to neglect kinetic and potential energy, but here it's passive, so I'm finding Q dot, right? So this little Q dot in, right, which is big Q dot divided by M dot, this is going to be H out minus H in, or H3 minus H2. So now, 
Here, if I was doing variable specific heat analysis, I'd have an expression that was only dependent on H's. And if I was doing constant specific heat, I would assume that the specific heat is constant throughout the whole system and not just for each component. So it's the same CP. Those CPs are going to drop out and I'm going to have a function of only temperatures. So if this was variable specific heat, now for both part A and part B, I have symbolic solutions and I would go to table A22 and I would solve for these enthalpies. Or if I was doing a constant specific heat analysis, then I have equations that are only based on temperatures or maybe temperatures and specific heat for the network. And then I'd have to go through and fix the state and find all those temperatures, right? So here again, I don't know T4 and T2, but I do know everything else. So basically in order to solve part A and part B, what I need to do is find T2 and T4. So how do I fix the states, right? So here, I think we're gonna do a constant specific heat analysis. So we're gonna assume that we're going to have constant CPs, which means that CP, CV, and K are all constant. So I can use expressions with K in the exponent. And I need to find what the isentropic processes are. The isentropic processes are gonna be the ones that are adiabatic. That's gonna be the compression as I go from state one to state two, and the turbine as I go from state three to state four. So I'm gonna start my state table at state one and I'm gonna to go to state two. So here I can use the isentropic relationships, right? And because I'm doing a constant specific heat analysis, then I'm going to look for an expression with K in the exponent. Here with open systems, it doesn't make sense to talk about volume ratios. So instead we talk about pressure ratios. So here I'm gonna look for an expression with K in the exponent that relates the temperature ratio to the pressure ratio, right? I know the pressure ratio, that's P2 over P1. In this case, that's eight, right? 800 divided by 100. K is 1.4, so I can work this out. So this is gonna be 0 0.4 divided by 1.4. And then I know T1, so the only thing I don't know here is T2. So I can isolate for T2 and find that it's 543 Kelvin. So this is a little bit like how we would do the compression stroke in an internal combustion engine, but because I don't know the volume ratios, I know the pressure ratios, then I use this expression with a uh, ratio of pressures. If we were doing variable specific heat analysis, we would say that uh, P2 over P1 is equal to PR2 over PR1. Right, so we'd look for the expression that has pressure ratios, but also has reduced pressures. And then we'd go to table A22, and we'd look at the column instead of VR, which we were looking for for internal combustion engines, we would look for the column that said PR in it. As I move from state two to state three, I recognize that this is not isentropic. This is the combustor. So I'm moving between state two and state three. I'm uh, burning my air fuel mixture. Although again, because this is an air standard analysis, we're assuming we're just adding heat, right? I know that P2 is equal to P3, right? Because I assumed that there were no friction losses. So here, I think that I've said that the pressure is constant because there's no friction loss. So here, P3 is equal to P2. So I just write that in, right? So now I know the temperature, I know the pressure, I'm done with this state. So now I can move to state three to state four. This is as I'm going through the turbine. And at least if it's an isentropic turbine or an ideal turbine, then I can use my isentropic relationships, right? So here I know that uh, first I gotta find P4, right? So here, remember there's two ways to do this. So we can say that the compression ratio is the same across the turbine and the pump right? It's just we flip it over for the turbine. Or we can recognize that here, this is a jet out to the environment. And here we're taking a jet into the environment. So both of these would be equal to the atmospheric pressure. So P4 has to equal P1. Or we can just take P3 and divide by our compressor ratio and get back to 100 kilopascals. So here P4 is equal to P1. Now I can use my isentropic relationship 
because I have the ratio of the pressures. Notice now that this is 1 over R instead of R. I still know K, and I know T3 because it was given to me in the problem that the maximum temperature was 1700. So now I can find T4, and when I've done that, now I've solved the whole problem. <coughs> so now, remember, to find my symbolic solutions for part A and B, the only things I didn't know were T2 and T4, but now I fixed all these states and I found these two things. Right. So if this was a variable-specific heat analysis, we would have had to go through, do some interpolation, and find the H's as well. We also would have found all the PR's because we'd have to use these ratios of reduced pressures to find the pressures for, uh, we'd use the pressure ratios and the reduced pressure ratios in order to interpolate back on that same line. So now we know T2 and we know T4. So we put these things into our equations. We found that the net power per unit mass flowing through the system would be 520.7 kilojoules per kilogram. So this is kind of nice because if you're uh, if you're trying to sell some of these things, you can look at your application and you can say, okay, maybe I need just over a megawatt of power. Well, that tells me um, how many kilograms per second that I'm going to need in order to get up to a megawatt of power. So you can kind of scale your process by changing your flow rate. We also see here that the thermal efficiency for this isentropic uh, cycle, right? Remember, we didn't have uh, isentropic efficiencies for the turbine or the compressor. So the uh, isentropic or the thermal efficiency here was just under 45%. But in a real case, it would end up being less than that because we'd have a turbine efficiency and a compressor efficiency, and that would kind of rob, you know, that would mean we'd get less power out of the turbine and we'd have to put more power into the compressor. So that hopefully gives you at least an introduction to these Brayton cycles and how they work. Essentially, there's some combination of a Rankine cycle because they're open systems and they're heat engines. But then it's also like a little bit of an internal combustion engine problem because the working fluid is air. So we're still looking for these isentropic processes and we're going to use the isentropic relationships for ideal gases. But we'll use different isentropic relationships here because we know the pressure ratios and not the volume ratios or the specific volume ratios. So just like when we did our first Rankine cycle problem, right, that had four components in it, you know, we might look at this thermal efficiency and say, man, it'd, it'd be nice if we could uh, get that efficiency better. So next class, we're going to think about what kind of processes we can add here to improve our thermal efficiency. Now, most of these are things that we've already seen in Rankine cycles. So you might remember reheat and you might remember regeneration. We're also going to talk about a different process called intercooling, which is kind of like the compressor side equivalent of reheat, where we're going to split the compression process into two different processes and cool the fluid in between. So next class, we'll talk about how we improve the efficiency of these Brayton cycles. So that was all that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to field those now. All right, thanks very much for your time. I will see you on Friday.